afternoon. I'm Kuna Boksal. I'm a founding partner of uh, Bulk Architects in Antwerp and also a professor at the university in the same small but lovely city you make a series about. We're um, very honored to be amongst uh, this fantastic selection and to show a bit about our work, but also about our city, um, the city where we live and where we work, and which we love. We, that's Bulk Architects, it's a team of um, around 20 people. Um, I started with Johan and Tom. Um, we you, we uh, refer to the city as our terroir, like uh, Chef Koch would uh, refer to his or her terroir. And I think most of our work is in Antwerp, um, not because we're extremely provincial, but because there's so much work and it's fantastic to go by bike. Um, on this map, I've located uh, the three projects I'll talk about in orange, and also um, the three locations where our office uh, was and is now. So we always have been living and working in the city. And we're currently living here in a fantastic building. Um, but we, most of our work is in Antwerp, but also in the rest of Belgium. We have little work in the Netherlands. Belgium being, um, as Renaud Bram called it, the ugliest country in the world. So this is a, a sort of sketch from the 1960s, um, where uh, Renaud Bram, our most fantastic uh, modernist architect, kind of mocks uh, the Catholic tradition of owning your own small house outside the country, um, underneath the church tower. And on the other hand, um, the socialist city, which is exaggerated as a sort of communist um, Comora. Uh, it's important to know that Belgium, um, as it is, always had a Catholic socialist government and there were two laws which have affected and uh, inflicted our landscape a lot. It's the Red Stupaya, kind of promoting um, house ownership. I think we're the country in Europe with the most um, private house owners. Um, this is a Catholic reflex taking away people from the city which was socialist uh, bulwarks. And on the other hand, the law Brunfo, which is a so socialist law um, providing easy money for socialist housing, social housing, but also often outside the city. And so when we started studying in the 90s, the um, neglect and decline of most um, bigger cities in, in Flanders was striking, um, leading to a sort of population leaving the city. So here you can see around the oil crisis, people really started leaving the city and it, it lasted until the millennium that, that uh, the population growth in the cities was uh, increasing again. Um, and this also led to, let's say, um, the rise of, uh, in Antwerp in 1991, almost 30% of people voting for extreme right uh, Nazi parties. Um, which was quite shocking at that time in the 90s when everything was fun and happy. Um, the city of Antwerp reacted in a quite specific way by uh, organizing um, a lot of competitions, international competitions in the tradition of the 90s on, on very specific locations, being the South, being the Elantje and being the Case. Um, unimaginable, but back then neglected waterfront areas. And there was um, one architect already looking forward to the future was Bob van Reet, whom you probably heard about. By this house, he kind of altered the sort of culture. And I think this guy is not to be underestimated. He was our elder man of culture when Antwerp was cultural capital. And he was a, quite an advocate for many of the buildings you admire and see now including the mass, I think he laid the first uh, stones of thinking about them. Our um, office um, started in 2000 together with the first city Baumeister uh, Flanders Hat in Antwerp, that was René Daniels. And since then we have been guided and um, led by fantastic figures 
who are in charge of the city uh, development and the sort of um, um, beauty chamber of the city, sort of guides of quality, um, jury members of architecture um, competitions and so on. And this coincides a bit with the uh, with the Flemish Baumeister you probably also heard about. So our, our office kind of grew with them, um, and it's quite funny to see that the last Flemish Baumeister was Erik Wiers, for instance, was one of the first uh, architects to work for the real estate company of the city, AG Vespa, that allowed young architects such as Erik Wiers back then, together with Erik Somers in Haasweek Architects to build a very tiny house, and now he's the big chief. Um, well, our office is just outside Ring Road. It's an incredible building by one of our professors. Uh, it's an old city library we bought, and we call it our flagship store. It's by Lode Wouters, uh, exoskelet in concrete. Um, yeah, we are very much interested in the tension between uh, form and content and between the city and the house or the interior and the public space. Um, I'm happy to call Paul Shepard my friend, so I really love his work and it's kind of influential um, in what we do and what we think about. We do a lot of things, we have no, um, we have no style maybe and we have no um, taste in scale. This is one of the first competitions we won. We do um, stage set design. This is a, a theater play about Renat Bram. Um, we do interior, small housing, uh, if it's in the city, um, pavilion to have a P in Blankenberg at the coast. Started like almost any Flemish architect with private housing, but now stop doing private houses unless it's for friends or in the city. So no more detached housing. Um, but this, let's say, a grasp of all the things we do. We like to do a lot with Darwin's Adagium quantity breeds quality. We, we invented the name of our office. Um, schools, public buildings. Um, we had a period where we were quite famous in doing rock venues, which was fantastic. Uh, obviously, that stopped now. And gradually, every year, somebody joined our office. So we started 20 years ago, and now we're 20 people um, with a focus on um, collective housing and public buildings. Um, and also, social housing is quite important in our uh, work. Some industrial buildings, um, and gradually leading to um, bigger projects in collaboration with, for instance, this one you probably have seen in the series before. Um, also in Ghent, we have quite a lot of work. Some social housing. And now leading to master plans. This is a recent competition we won for 300 social houses to be reconverted for the Flemish Baumeister. And this is our new, um, latest biggest one in Rotterdam, uh, together with Hattel Cornelis. Um, we are engaged in teaching, so um, some of us teach, and this is, for instance, a uh, research project we started in the office. It's called the Baumeister label, so it's a, it's a label um, rewarded every year for a practice that's um, looking for some research inside the office. This is about the architecture of the construction or the construction of architecture. Um, what we call the first and the last architecture is the idea of the the building as an intelligent ruin. Um, we like to do a lot and we like to test a lot and we like to draw. We think the drawing is, a, is an argument in making architecture. It's maybe um, our uh, reason of being. Without drawings, we wouldn't exist. Um, and this drawing can have many means, so it's important, I think, to show that we like to draw. This is for the stage set, um, making a frog out of a uh, we call it barrier wheel, and uh, a lot of sketching um, just to also test everything we make or invent in real time that's not unique, but I think we put a lot of energy and love in it, where every drawing has a certain um, means to an end, and sometimes the drawing is 
uh, deliberately used to put people off their feet to make a sort of weird, innocent, Quaker-like village for uh, the biggest dirty developer we met. So far, it's quite funny to see them uh, also have to leave their comfort zone and to start also thinking in arguments. Um, and that's why it's important, I think, to, to every time challenge and question the way we draw and what we draw and why we do it in every stage of a project, um, including our signature. It's a bit of a, a running gag to smuggle uh, our signature in every building as if we were 19th century Baumeisters. Uh, sometimes we have to make it ourselves, and then it's a bit messy, but anyhow. Um, and we, we like to work a lot in models. So there's a, there's a lot of um, projects that are tested, again, in any stage, from a very early set till, till a mock-up, um, with such a simple thing as a Belgian snellbau brick. Um, and it's funny to see stage design as a sort of uh, small reoccurring thing in our practice where we can test um, materials and spaces without any commercial restraints. Uh, just briefly flip through all these images. That I hope show a bit the, the, the range and the um, quantity of the things we try to do. And it's funny, we hardly make any renders. And, and it's always funny to see how scale models kind of evoke a childish reaction in people where everybody gets happy from the nastiest mayor or um, um, boring elder man all of a sudden awakes. And I've never seen that happen with a render. I called the, the lecture domesticating the public. I could have also called it the intimate city. Um, I think we live in a sort of intimate city. It's a small city with the second biggest harbor of Europe. So there's a sort of weird clash of almost in, in a sort of um, village-like quality in Antwerp and yet a metropolis in this combination is, is funny and weird, but also intriguing in the way people behave. And it's, really within our interest to think about the city as a sort of intimate space. Um, we have a fondness for photography and I'm quite, my favorite is called Eugène Aché. This is a series Aché made in Paris when the city was kind of transforming from a, from a village into a metropolis where you can still see a sort of clash of, of village-like things with metropolitan elements. Um, some of those pictures, of course, very famous, but, but um, this lady selling milk cans in the literal territorial depth of her uh, threshold. Ache also uh, documenting maybe uh, professions that were lost that you could, could kind of associate with village-like um, activities. And it's quite intriguing. This is my favorite. We are actually looking at, let's say, not the finest ladies of the pack, but again, they have uh, dressed up and they made herself look elegant. They are slightly higher than, than uh, we or Ache or the sp uh, spectator. They look familiar in a way, they are family and they kind of mock us looking at them. Um, and I think it's such an a intimate picture. You don't know what's behind them. Maybe they are working in a sewer atelier or something. So it's, for me, it's, this is a beautiful picture and it's maybe what we want to achieve with our buildings, to make this kind of slightly sturdy, yet elegant and friendly um, figures in the city. And another series which always has struck me is, is the sort of documentation of the loss of public space in, in your uh, fantastic country after Thatcher, where all of a sudden all publicness and elegance and a sort of um, citizenship is wiped out um, together with the welfare, welfare state. So that the sort of lack of quality of a ceiling, even lightning of signature, this one is of, of course famous, sort of lack of, of of perspective and dignity 
where people are almost treated as cattle I, always struck me and, and, and I think we try to compensate a little in our public spaces to make them look like houses or at least give them a, a, a familiar feeling. I think this is the kind of shows um, how after the uh, oil crisis and, and, and foul ceilings and the sort of uh, loss of, of permanentness eventually leads to a poster of a, a horse, which is striking. Um, well, I'll show you three projects we did in the last years. All of them are in Antwerp. Um, and all of them, funny enough, are commissioned by the city or by AG Vespa being our um, most favorite customer. AG Vespa is the uh, real estate company of the city um, with a, an absolute love for architecture and young architects. That's the same what's known. Um, this is a, a sorry, a, a creche, a daycare, like a kindergarten and combined with housing. Um, it's in one of the weirdest neighborhoods of Antwerp. It's called the Conforta area. The Conforta area was built on a former swamp and it's the biggest housing campaign uh, Belgium has ever had. Uh, 2,500 houses built at the same time by one company, and the Comptoir de Batiment Conforta. Um, it had a certain grandeur to it when it opened, a sort of splendor, which rapidly um, um, sung the neighborhood, um, provided a big growth in the city population of this uh, fourth town of Dorme, leading to the first socialist mayor um, Belgium has ever had. But it was a sort of fraud because you had to build, uh, following the Antwerp building rules, you had to build four meters between partition walls. And these guys had built four meters access to access. So stealing 30 centimeters every um, house, which led to the 13th house being given away to the so social security. Um, the type plans are really fascinating. Um, a bit nerdlings avant la lettre on a swamp, so the quality of the housing is really, really poor. And nowadays it's a bit of a problematic uh, neighborhood with a rather big impact, so it's a sort of um, banlieue just outside of Antwerp. Most people try to avoid. Um, our client had bought uh, an industrial bakery that has, as a sort of cannibal, had, had eaten itself into the building block by gradually buying these uh, small Conforta houses and combining them into a in sort of industrial complex. And as they were leaving, um, Aja Vespa bought it and, and uh, um, started this plan. So the collage of the, of the entire complex was striking and the question in competition deep as much as possible. And we did a, a very thorough analysis, but at the same time we invited secretly some um, Demolishing companies, there was a quest for a passive housing complex. And I think we won the competition with this slide that there's a point where you can keep remodeling and remodeling and where it becomes really sad. And, and, and um, so we. Building blocks since this neighborhood has been remodeled in the most fantastic yet also a sad way um, with some skill jumps Venturi would be very jealous about. So we, we cleaned up because we had to provide quite a big program and a passive housing complex. And we found out that by demolishing the site, we could have three houses more, so it could almost pay for itself or even better. Uh, or the kernel of the building block with some new green, um, we have two addresses, the address for the crèche or the daycare center and eight houses and an address for four extra houses and the um, service of that crèche. Seven bays of houses, um, quite echoing the most beautiful street of that neighborhood. It's almost Frank Lloyd Wright-like uh, prairie version of a row house version of a prairie house. Um, having the legs of those houses on ground. Those legs being actually as uh, having the same width as the original Conforta houses, which is a front door and a bike. Um, 
and then making a barcode from the uh, streets with those legs to an interior playroom, sleeping zone, playroom, garden for the children, and then the other garden, the other houses, and the other um, streets. And this is a sort of uh, organization plan where you can see the landing um, of seven houses, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then this is a passageway going through the building block, providing access to two extra houses here and then two support houses here with a garden. And this is, weirdly enough, was not in the program. It's an outdoor garden for children. And this was not in the program. It's the culmination or combination of all circulation into an indoor garden. Um, here you can see the exploded flu, the passageway through the building block leading to the service area, kitchen personnel, and then always those legs of the houses landing uh, on the ground floor, which is uh, the entire kindergarten, and then the legs providing access to some row houses, let's say, on top of the facades. It's the first passive project we did. So this, this project is almost self-providing in its energetic uh, behavior. But it leads us quite far. I don't know. What's important is that we have a very deep plan and that in the plan you can also see this sort of barcode with the legs and niches. This is the indoor playroom. This is a sleeping area uh, with some daylight in the middle of the plan. This is the playroom and then the garden and on top is a row house with a huge terrace overlooking the garden. Here you can see the plan with those three um, you know, hallways providing access to always one living group of 20 kids. Um, section. And then a technical section making a passive house construction with brick. We were lucky to have a fantastic contractor. Um, we always try to, to put some love in, in uh, the choice of material and also demand it from people executing our work that they, that they engage with the same amount of love. So for instance, the houses are done in an uh, in-situ cast concrete uh, deck. And I must say that in our career of 20 years, we had some idiots, but most of the time we were extremely lucky to have really engaged contractors that kind of admire the energy we put in it and, and, and answer it with the same amount of energy. This is the um, you know, first kind of British looking series of houses. It's also a bit inspired on the original Comforta atmosphere, which, which um, took its inspiration from the Netherlands. Um, the front doors of the houses with this echo of um, the Comforta enlarging a small-scale house. These two entrances are uh, mirrored in order to provide a, a public entrance that is a bit on scale of the small human beings that are the clients of this building. Um, this is a kitchen window. This is a, a bedroom window, sort of trying to engage towards the street despite the passive house uh, restrictions. This kind of celebrates the series of houses we find everywhere in this neighborhood. Um, so it tries to fit in. You can almost see um, the echoes and, and the sort of color and the play of the soldiers' courses that, that kind of remark are quite remarkable in this um, massive housing campaign of 2,500 houses. The front door, um, the entrance to the kindergarten or the, the daycare. This is the empty. Um, indoor space we kind of gave to the city. It's a gift of Gluck by combining all the corridors and then it, it loved a lot. So this is a sort of indoor um, playground space where you have the, the, the niches towards the streets and then the three entrances towards the um, actual daycare zones. This is the sleeping area where all the techniques are bundled and here you can see the, the coming in of daylight 
uh, thanks to those three cupolas in the middle of every uh, couple of um, you know, bedrooms and playrooms. Um, they're doubled in order to save personnel so that when something happens in one group with a big sliding door, um, you can sort of combine two groups. And it's really funny to build for little human beings and uh, trying to avoid their smashing each other's head with a, a door. So we had a sort of datum running through the, the entire project on the scale of um, little plants, even leading to the garden wall, which is in, in green caulk, so you can draw on it. And this is a combination of a natural garden. We had really had to strive for real grass and um, real trees. And, and then we, uh, Stefan Moral, our landscape architect, made this kind of uh, almost artificial tele to be sort of playground things a bit based on Aldo Van Eck's work, but then in funky uh, yellow paint. And these are the houses. So this is the kitchen. I Vespa provides the houses empty, so they, they can uh, sell them like this in order to have people um, make their own interior and to kind of appropriate their own house and also, in order also to, to keep the prices as low as possible. Um, this is the kitchen window towards the street with the uh, staircase some doors of bedrooms. These are the other houses on the other side of the street, which are actually um, two row houses and two apartments crawling over them like this. So this is one, two, this is three. And at the other end of this picture is four. Voila, that's um, the first one. This one I think you'll, uh, you'll like a lot. We do, do at least. So this is a this is in the city center. It's next to the central station area, which was a, a beautiful street in the 19th century. Uh, until the, the 1920s, the station areas were beautiful spots of bourgeoisie and so on. Um, and as you can see, the initial parceling of the 19th century uh, terraced or row houses that make Antwerp so typical is visible, but you can also see some attacks scale-wise on this plot um, system of the streets. And these were the existing buildings. Actually, it's um, two of those terraced houses were owned by the um, social security company, and this was their previous restaurant and homeless shelter. Um, but you can also see that in this street, a lot of um, stuff had happened in the 50s and 60s kind of ignored this initial beautiful parceling of the of the classical 19th century um, house mania inspired row house. This is a big chain Jacob's nightmare with, with some neglect of grain and scale with dead plinths, with, with uh, massive attention towards cars and so on. And the question we made was, are we going to make the same institutional mistake if we have to provide um, a shelter for homeless people, a daycare center, and also a sort of shelter for often women with children uh, which are homeless or had to run away from some violent situations at home. And we found inspiration in, in uh, someone's house that is actually a museum. It's one building and it's three buildings, and, and it, it combines in a way um, the feeling of being everywhere and nowhere and yet having these very specific house-like qualities. And, and we thought for somebody who is homeless, the first thing he lacks indeed is a home, so maybe we have to provide a sort of home. So we found a structure based on the, on the idea of the terraced house or the row house with the two buildings, um, the city bought being part of a threesome. So these are the three existing buildings of which we had two um, to reconvert or to remodel. So you can have three plus three, but you can also read two with a central one and two. And that central one is actually used as a, as a porch or a carriage house where you can go 
inside into a small garden not provided in the program. So you see, we always try to provide some outdoor space. And this is a bit the daycare center. Uh, it's for people to have um, homeless people to have medical advice, to have their paperwork done, but it's like almost like a cafe um, without alcohol. Uh, we visited a building with the same program in Ghent, which I thought was striking in its in its um, yeah almost inhumane um, and harsh looking materialization. This was the garden, so called garden, and everything was based on Hufter proof because, of course, not all the people visiting that center are mega gently people, but. We thought, is there no other way to, to kind of use Hufter proof stuff to make a house like quality? Um, and can't we make, rather than a big building, can't we make just five friendly yet Hufter proof houses? And of course, we have to be careful. This is where they come from. We have to avoid giving them this because you can understand that it would raise questions, political questions, but also spending of tax money so where is the balance between this cardboard house and uh, room 606 in the red sunsets um, and we thought maybe the the the, the balance is exactly on this hoofter proof the idea of making a space um, cladding it in the interior and thereby um, saving it um, from traces and uh, neglect So, for instance, the rooms had to be 1.2 meters higher than a normal height, only due to odor and smell of those people and the and sort of refreshing rate of the air. So if you do so, you end up with a very small uh, cell. So we, we really tried to, to look at how could we use all those elements um, um, to provide a house-like atmosphere. And then we looked at the two existing buildings. Um, all the other competitors demolished them. We kind of did a thorough analysis of what was useful and what was not, including historical analysis of those two terraced houses. And in the end, we decided to keep the, uh, the basement, the peritage, to keep the facade and to remodel the initial plan to the uh, um, original idea and, and, and providing a new floor here and an extra new floor here in concrete due to fire regulations and acoustics this was a sort of um, semi uh, restoration semi uh, new building and then how do you make two or three new row houses next to really beautiful ones and so Asplund's town hall is a i think fantastic in the way it treats history, it brings it into the in the future almost. So this kind of puzzle doble or paraphrasing we always have loved. Um, this is one of our early works for Vespa, um, where we think it's both sturdy and refined. Um, a bit like those three ladies I showed in the Ache picture. Um, yeah, some reference. And I think this was a, was a, a sketch of the two facades, which we definitely restore at its full glory, then the, the, the sort of uh, gatehouse, and then the two uh, siblings here in order to make a, a family. Whereas the pavilion in the garden was kind of uh, dug out a little bit to stay um, at garden wall height. And so, sorry, this is the model. Um, uh, where you see the sorry, where you see the two original terrace houses. This is the gatehouse, and this is a kind of copy of those two, but then mirrored, uh, in order not, not to make it too boring. Passage underneath medical cabinets into the garden, where this kind of cafe is going on. The offices of the personnel and staff on the restored um, beritage, and then not in the program, but also again provided sort of public space where the um, stage with a piano is on top of the electricity boot, a high voltage electricity boot that was higher than expected. So that generated a stage with an address for single men often, an address for the daycare, 
an address for the personnel and as far as possible from those dirty single men, the address of women and children, all of them homeless. And then the, the structure of the five houses, rather than having this sort of hospital-like quality, the biggest houses with more bedrooms for families or women and children, um, as a sort of small pension, rather than a hotel, but also not a prison. And then these three structures, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, these three structures always providing different sort of rooms, a bit song-like, chanson-like quality. And then on top, the um, existing terraced houses culminate in a playground. This is a disabled person's apartment. And then this roof is for the children being away from the street as far as possible, and at least for a small moment being barons in the trees with their own fantastic luxurious rooftop garden. These are the two houses, part of a series of three. The city is now trying to buy this one so we can keep going. This is the um, passage house which is a bit lifted and these are then the two paraphrases of those houses with the plinth echoed with the public space with the piano here and then this is the address the men, personnel, and the women. And this is the public uh, entrance. And in the back, it's a bit sauvage, with the garden, as I said, a bit dug out. Um, here is a washing facilities, washing machines, and showers. These are the two existing houses, and this is the mirrored one. Um, a small section to the project. So here you can see the electricity booths with the um, washing basement, this is the piano and the public stage, and then here you see one of the houses, the middle one, having a, a sort of a Solnesque light well. A section through the passage, where you are slightly going down underneath medical cabinets, this is the sort of um, uh, welcome desk where you can subscribe to the program, have medical check, or go inside, and so on. And these are then the smaller rooms. And this is a section through the renovels existing terraced houses with their mansard roof and sink restored, with the offices fully restored, um, the bel etage of an office. And this is the janitor's apartment in the basement. And the center in the back, which works as a bit of a pavilion with roof lights. Another model, a very small street to build in with a tram. So construction logics. Um, but I think it would lead us too far to explain all this. And then many interior models to see how we can use, as I said, the, the sort of hüfter proof stuff exactly to make planning, to make new datums in a room. Um, this, for instance, is a, a bamboo paneling because yeah, people pee in the room, they scratch the walls and they hurt themselves. Lightning has to be fixed. And so we really did a, a, a weaning amongst us, Astrid, who worked on this project uh, for two years, really did a tremendous job making everything which is annoying into a quality. This is the facade. So these are the two remodeled houses. This one is still um, not part of the project, but as you can see, it's part of the composition. Uh, and the funniest thing is that normally in Belgium, the partition walls are clad in, in cheap concrete stuff. But since these partition walls is Kind of the wallpaper of the of the roof terrace we used the most expensive cladding we ever did it's uh, green portuguese tiles the material is um uh, precast concrete this is a standard paving brick uh, all the materials have to do with on the street being on and off the street this is a standard paving brick which echoes the the cassettes of the existing houses and this is the cheapest concrete brick you can find in belgium so there's a sort of balance between being a ridiculously uh, posh on a small surface and then uh, as cheap as possible without being cheap um, for the big surfaces. This is for instance a staircase that is necessary for safety if somebody gets pissed or angry 
the person has to uh, able to escape, or we can uh, detail it as, as, as if it were a library staircase in a sort of weird English mansion house. So everything is a bit used. We asked all our photographers we worked with to make um, one work about homeless or roofless, it's called in, in Dutch, tack loss without a roof. And they gave this as a piece of art, but actually it's, it's the acoustics of the, of the space. So this is a sort of um, picture that was donated by all the photographers we've been working with for 20 years. Uh, but it's used in the budget of acoustics. One Moroccan guy doing the entire tiling of this project, two years long, sort of hero, um, using acoustics as a festive element, um, using a hoofdproof plinth uh, to make a feast. These are the fantastic Portuguese styles. So everywhere you can touch the outdoor space. This is a voliera. Um, that has to be filled now. Um, of course, there's no people on the pictures because it's it's kind of not okay to photograph many of them. Um, but here you can also see the, the attention toward the outdoor spaces and trying at least to give a certain uh, um, yeah, high quality to those spaces where you can at least for a while be off the streets. And, And it's really funny because now it's two years uh, and, and the company that, that exploits it compares it with their other um, centers and says that this one is uh, only 20% demolition compared to the other ones and they think it's because it looks very beautiful. Um, this is a light well in the central house. Here you can see uh, the bamboo uh, paneling. This is daylight in the middle of the plan with even a sort of public square uh, in Herzberger in Antwerp. And this is a, let's say a bedroom where everything is, is hoofed proof, but at least it doesn't look like that. So in a way it treats people like um, human beings, not like uh, beasts. Okay, there's one more project I want to show. It's a, it's a recent one, it's fresh, fresh from the book. Uh, it's a competition we won next to the uh, Gaddix um, A5 building block, Stephen Bates and Dirk Somers probably talked about. We made that block together, the three of us, but we won a competition next door together with our friends from um, Stockholm General Architecture. It's a project again by Ari Vespa, which, uh, which tried to correct a certain um, trend, that is that the Cadix area is uh, definitely a victim of its success and being heavily gentrified, where the city has a conclusion that there's almost no children in that neighborhood. So the initial plot uh, for this competition was to be a school, but since there's no children in the neighborhood, the school is now canceled by a, a sort of um, correctional project that tries to uh, look for an alternative for a freestanding family house and tries to, to um, in, based on the Basel and Zurich projects, to engage in family-friendly stacked housing. It was a big competition and we were extremely happy and lucky I think, to win. Uh, it was quite welcome after Corona year. So this is the Cadix A5 block. This is the, the building by Sertz and Bates. This is a corner or the, the, the Palazzo by Bovenbau, uh, the Exomers, and these three buildings are from our uh, office. Um, and this is the actual new plot, which will be next to what's called the Schengen Plan, an extrusion into the water of a, of a big public space. Um, as you know, or as you don't know, the Talanj is, is one of the hot spots of Antwerp. It, it used to be our favorite spot before it got really gentrified. It's where the city meets the harbor. You can still feel um, the kind of scale jumps uh, of housing 
next to an industrial artifacts, which in a way is, is, is used as an image quality plan. Um, this is a project you probably also have seen by Apple Cornelius so together with Stephen Taylor. It kind of is in a way the DNA of the neighborhood is this kind of shoulder to shoulder warehouses as books on a shelf. Um, but on the other hand, there's also these uh, six incredible towers that kind of uh, jump scale and, and, and um, evoke, let's say, the recent ambitions of the city uh, scale wise. So we were thinking about um, many things in this competition. Uh, one of them being, do we show the authorship and what is the identity of a, a square-like building block that has to consist out of multiple parts? Um, are we actually making four buildings or are we making a circle with four towers? What about addresses for children? Where do you live? Can you point towards your own house? What about the non-built space? Um, and I think this is also why we won our fantastic clients. Rather than providing the uh, demanded 30% family-friendly houses, opted for 60% of big apartments with a, a fantastic attention towards child friendliness and so on and so on. Um, a lot of contacts of this building block with the neighborhood, both in private addresses and, and living rooms on street level, but also in a way uh, some commercial spaces could engage um, towards the street and a lot of passages through the building block to make it breathe. If you would read the brief of this competition, you would be um, impressed, I think, because the level of the question, the quality of the question was that high that I think all the uh, contributors had a fantastic project. Um, Vespa asked us to think about family-friendly housing and to provide as many possible options. And, and we kind of reacted with a beautiful quote of Le Corbusier that life is always right, so we can invent as many family-friendly uh, uh, plans. There will be always a family that's different. People divorce, people get an extra one, families reunite, you have to take grandma into the house, and at 18 somebody leaves to go study abroad, and so on and so on. So, Life is always right. How can we make an answer for all those um, situations? Yet we have to uh, provide some demonstrations. Um, I'll quickly guide you through the, the choices we made. So the first thing is that we think a big garden is important for children so you can um, put them outside, they can get dirty uh, and until a certain age, they still can be under your um, guidance. We provided huge uh, apartments, flexible and generous cascos with flexible plans, um, two orientations, many possible bedrooms, also big floor heights to have a sort of uh, bunk bed or even storage above a door. Inventive floor plans where you would have separate hallways for children where you can also play, a big kitchen, um, enough storage space for the eternal washing machine, um, maybe put an extra bathroom next to the toilet so in all of a sudden you have two bathrooms, but also on city level having, if not that many parking spots, but if we have parking spots that are big enough to have a maxi cozy or a crate of beer in your hands and a, and a wine baby, big lifts with elevators, some ground-bound houses, active plinths, clear addresses, uh, spaces for bikes on level zero, not in the minus one, a washing saloon and hallways that have spots for or um, storage for strollers and buggies and little bikes and so on. So the, the sort of um, empathic thing you always miss in, in any developer's um, project and I think our developers in a way are fantastic because they're really engaged in it. Leading to this project, so it actually consists of um, two smaller buildings and two bigger buildings. You can here see the axonometry, a big garden um, in the middle of this plan, and then really uh, a very, very thorough study, not only on how architecture looks, but also what it can mean for people that live in it. Um, this is a Schengen plan, 
This is the water side, the west sides. This is the street in between our building, our building block with SBA and Bogenbau, and the new one. And this is um, a series of houses. The the garden is meant to be a, an oasis where you can where you can play, not play soccer because then you can go outside. There's a square there to play soccer, but this is a sort of until six years under the supervision and still able to be outside with some water and also a sort of connection with a, a fantastic terrace on top and always connected, vis visible from the outside, also a bit as a gift to the city. Um, the Allentje neighborhood is uh, designed by Pierre Bruno Pudla, that's our private Antwerp Schinkel, a neoclassicist, fantastic hero. One of the things he asked for was a chamfered corner, so in a way it's a bit of a, a small uh, example, Barcelona plan in Antwerp. Um, there are some echoes, for instance, of this corner in our projects. Um, you can also see the yellow houses, which are quite remarkable, also the kind of neoclassicist last echoes of that neighborhood, which is, uh, I think the Swedes are better neoclassicists than we are. Um, anyway, they're a fantastic collaboration. This is a dock site where, unlike any other entry in, in the competition, we didn't fully fill the top location, but we let uh, evening sun come into the building. Uh, this is called the Tallinn Towers. This is the dock building. It's a sort of small uh, Viking, Lord of the Rings, this small Viking of the Lord of the Rings, and this is our Palazzo Silo. Um, a lot of attention is towards the passageways. Uh, how can you connect the streets to the inner courtyard? Of course, controlled, but how can children, for instance, run outside and engage in the city? This is a project by Gea that uses this kind of passageway. And this is one of ours in Ghent that celebrates cutting through a building block. Um, yeah, and even connecting it maybe to lively plinth where some things can happen that are compatible with family-friendly housing like, like a cafe or a coffee bar, maybe cash, whatever. Uh, we'll see. Um, clear addresses where you can say I'm living there and not there, so we try to avoid a sort of mini barbican, uh, too complex uh, organization in these projects. And here you can see it um, in the landscape of the city where you can recognize the Bovenbau Palazzo, the Stephen Bates Harbor building of the New York building. And then this being echoed here, this one being a bit uh, part of a series of very small, cute buildings in the harbor. And this kind of neoclassical, um, very modest, and quiet Swedish building in between them. As you can see, the Especially in the summer, the, the shading of the inner courtyard is fantastic. Um, so full sun in summer and also in spring and autumn, a lot of sun there. It's a brilliant, excellent project. We try to use the water for transport. We try to, um, to make a building that can last and that people can look after and that also looks after people. I think the most important contribution uh, from our office in the debate in the last 20 years is what we call cultural durability. We think that a building that is, that is um, made in a, in a in, with, with some love and craftsmanship is the most durable one you can imagine. And it's better to invest in a bit extra money for things that should last, like facades, the construction, um, to think about where you don't build and where you do build. But that a building that is treated in a, in a, in a fantastic way uh, and that looks after people will be looked after itself. And that for us is more important than adding the last uh, photovoltaic solar panel. So the idea of cultural durability um, or the building as an intelligent ruin is, I think, a sort of Antwerp uh, theme that you might have recognized with other contributions in this series. Um, Voilà, so this is the Talent Tower, this is the, the Palazzo Silo, the garden being connected to the, the roof terrace. Um, bikes first, so there's a lot of uh, attention uh, on, on bike level. Uh, for every cushion there's a bike provided and all of the bikes are either on ground floor or 
higher, but nobody has to go down the part on the ramp with some extra um, um, small wheels. It helps, of course, if one of our clients is a, is a, is a fanatic biker. So we even provide a spot to clean your mountain bikes. You can also go mountain biking and the lifts are big enough to um, carry, carry bikes all the way up. The parking has a, has a nice spot, which is nicely lit, which has a friendly atmosphere with some extra height in order to maybe within 20 years use this space for some other uh, more useful means than storing um, cars. Here you can see the section from the water to the, the main street, and you can see indeed that the west building allows a lot of daylight to come in. This is a, let's say, quite huge apartments. Um, and here you can see the idea of two stacked maisonettes. So this is a one house, and then there's a galleria, and then there's a triplex on top of it. Um, I'll come back to that later. Yeah, we, we, we try to think about how do the buildings belong together? How, how can they um, be a sort of family or at least, how do you see it, genealogically connected? Um, is it a silo? Is it a palazzo? Is it maybe both? So we call it palazzo silo and we use, let's say, the voluta or the, the chamfered corner as a motif. We have two towers in the middle, uh, Rizalit, but then again, a building with a plinth of body and a sort of weird um, silhouette like crown. That's this one. It has changed since then, but the ideas are the same. This is the Tallinn Tower. It's, it's the same idea of a warehouse, but then let's say more robust and maybe also more modest like. With an expression of tectonics and stacking, um, this one is beautiful. I think it's also by here. Yeah, it's, it's a sort of sturdy little Viking that stands in the middle of those two big shots. Um, but by its mere proportion, kind of, uh, I kind of love this building already. And this is uh, ours again, so it's, it's a sort of um, echo of the. Just a Sanefi complex in Rotterdam, where you have uh, a maisonette here and a maisonette on top of it. It's actually also an echo of, of our, one of our contributions in the previous Cadix plot, where we have the same typology. So we, we kind of refer to the Cadix area by having always five to six yellow houses that are um, almost like, like confetti in that neighborhood um, around. So these are four now, in total, uh, eight houses. Um, and as, as the Cadix area has this kind of coherent diversity, like almost like a Morandi painting where it belongs, it still is remarkably different. Uh, I think it's a nice theme to keep going. Um, so this is a bit the family portrait of, of those four buildings. Uh, none of them being super eccentric, and hopefully none of them super boring, but we hope together they can they their sort of alliance um, and it's quite funny that after 20 years, we can have a street which is full of our buildings. So this is the Bovenbau building which begins and this one stops. And therefore, it's all also a bit bluish. Um, so we try to make a coherent project across two building blocks um, without losing the attention for identity, but also trying to avoid the sort of hyperbolic uh, um, hyperbolic macho uh, stuff that, that it's a bit annoying across the street, for instance. Um, I won't show you all the plans because then we'll hear to tomorrow evening. But anyhow, you can see the attention of coming home, bikes, big entry halls, um, possibility of storage. Somebody needs to go to the toilet when you're coming down from the seventh floor, and this little human being needs then it's nice to have a toilet on level zero that's also child friendly. Um, of course, it's a big program, but on the other hand, our clients has to do less and bigger apartments, which is the first time in 20 years we have this question. Often double orientation of terraces, um, and the higher we go, the less building there is. This is the Galleria, giving access to the four um, stacked 
mesonets on top with a stairwell to the garden, even as a sort of sliding, uh, sliding tube, what is it, sliding device. Um, and then this is a pavilion overlooking the evening sun, overlooking the water in the evening sun, which you can use in a communal way for a kid's party or a I don't know, yoga lesson, whatever. Um, and then all of a sudden, it's only some towers, which then are, let's say, to pay for the family-friendly uh, contribution downstairs. Nothing of this we invented ourselves. Everything already exists, but I think we made a sort of um, fine combination of, of what was there uh, and looked really thoroughly. It's really fun to talk about those plants. Um, so if you allow me, I'll just show you, this is a plan um, for a family with three bedrooms and there's a sort of additional small apartment you can either buy or rent or don't buy um, with it. So it's a sort of possible combination for grandma or au pair or even students uh, that does or does not belong to your family with a beautiful diagonal view from the hallway coming in, culminating into the terrace. Put some space um, left, it's a rather small one, unless you combine it with an extra unit. It's based on this uh, Knapkwitz and Fikker department, the diagonal thing that is. Um, this is a beautiful one, I think. It is um, uh, actually one uh, bedroom apartment if you want to. It's uh, with a Swedish idea, kitchen, cooking and eating together, again a diagonal view. And then it has two uh, bedrooms which belong to the apartment, which, which also can be accessed to an extra uh, entrance. So this is, let's say, the, the annoying teenage uh, rebel room, but could also be grandpa or even uh, rented out and then using this bathroom and then these people have used this bathroom. So you can, you can have many uh, configurations in this apartment. Um, this one also has an, an access balcony with a giant hallway, which is also storage maybe even a second bathroom. And this is a sort of home office bedroom, two kids' bedrooms towards this balcony with a sort of kids' department if they want to watch television or play. And then this is even an extra bedroom. This is a very big one in the top building with a terrace towards the water and a big terrace towards the garden. One of the biggest ones. Um, this one you can enter. The toilet is a second bathroom. So this is a bit uh, sort of children departments, the hallways are connected to the big hallway with a glazed um, door and an extra so window. So all of a sudden you can make a sort of uh, play room in the hallway with your neighbor friend. And then it has a um, double orientation, also a diag diagonal quality with a sort of separate bedroom with a separate ensuite bathroom. So a uh, huge stairs also leading to the garden. And then this one is uh, uh, the biggest one. You see even a department here and a sleeping department here, both having bathrooms, bedrooms, huge storage space, and then a fantastic uh, living room. Um, this is based on Perez. Uh, let's say the most beautiful apartment in the world is for me Perez, model apartment in La Habre. Um, but again, who am I? Um, this is the, the duplex house, ground ground. So you have a front door with some uh, storage for bikes, you have storage for a stroller and all their uh, shoes, toilet and a staircase, a kitchen engaging to the public realm, um, eating and dining with the private terrace with a few steps up here in the garden. And if you take the stairwell up, so it's like a small Belgian rural house in a way. Um, in the middle of the city. And then on top of this one is the Galleria, where you have a bench uh, in the facade, so you can use it also as a terrace. It has this kitchen and living in the bay window, also a hallway like the other one, but then mirrored. Take the stairwell up, you can almost open up all those doors. It's this drawing. So all of a sudden the hallway becomes a sort of playground for your 
Marklin uh, train. The daylight in the middle of this space is provided by a roof light here. And then we can take the stair up again, and there's a sort of uh, final room, um, like an attic uh, to sleep or to, to make an evening living with two terraces. We have one, two, three terraces, even four benches. Um, voila, that's, uh, that's, that's it, I think. Um, we are super happy for this one. This building now is almost finished, so we can keep um, working in our uh, city. Thanks, guys, for the attention. At Brickworks van de Mortel, we make high-quality bricks, slips and clay pavers in unique colors and sizes. From our new brick lab in Belgium, we support architects in the UK and around Europe. As a partner, we collaborate with the architect to transform his vision into reality with an open mind, technical knowledge and tailor-made solutions. As a family-held company, we remain accessible at all levels, which makes our company extremely customer-focused. In all those years, we never lost our core values and stand for sustainability, quality, teamwork and, of course, our passion that we would love to share with you.